Tune Up, your Wednesday night Bible study. Each week we gather together to tune in to the Word of God, learning and growing as we study how to apply God's Word in our everyday lives. Join us at 7.30 for this powerful Bible study experience. And now, let's get ready for Tune Up. Welcome to The Tune-Up, a new interactive Bible study hosted by Global Outreach Church. I'm Lynette Jackson, and I wanted to just come on for a few moments just to share some information about this new Bible study. It is an interactive Bible study, so you can ask questions of our speakers. So all you have to do is just put your comments or ask a question in the comment section on Facebook and our speaker will be acknowledging those and reading those and answering your questions at the end of the Bible study. The second thing is this QR code at the top of the screen there. If you scan that QR code, you'll be able to give an offering at the end of service. You'll be able to donate to our food pantry. You'll be able to go to our website. You'll be able to leave a prayer request because that is super important. And you'll also be able to view our previous messages. I'm so excited that we're starting this new Bible study format uh, this year in 2023, uh, hosted by Global Outreach Church. Well, I'm Lynette Jackson, and if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get ready for a tune-up. Hallelujah. Good evening. And we thank God for another time in His presence. And it's by His strength and His power that we are here this evening. Hallelujah. Let's worship Him. Yes, Lord. 
Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Brother Diola. That was so powerful. And welcome tonight to the tune-up. I uh, hope you have had a great day. And I pray that something that God will say tonight will lift you up, encourage you. The Bible says that God of Israel is the one that gives strength and power to his people. And it is my hope and expectation that that God will rejuvenate you and give you a tune-up like never before. Glory to God. Welcome again. And I want to thank you so much for choosing to spend your evening with us tonight. And I am trusting that God will meet you at your point of need, strengthen you, give you power, and tune you up for the journey ahead of you. And so tonight, I'm going to be teaching on the subject, the Christian's life and warfare. And I just want to encourage you, before we get deep into the teaching, call your friends, ask a family member to sit around the, around the table so that together you can partake of this meal that God has prepared for us. Again, the Christian's 
life and warfare. I'm going to be using the book of Nehemiah to teach this series of teaching. And so this is what's happening. Every Wednesday night for the next several weeks, I'm going to be, I'm going to be teaching this Christian life and warfare using the book of Nehemiah. Now, on Sunday mornings at Go Church, I'm teaching from the book of Ephesians chapter 6 on standing your ground against the enemy. So we're going to have two parallel teachings going on at the same time. On Sunday mornings, from the book of Ephesians, standing your ground against the enemy. And again, if you've missed the first installment last Sunday, I want to encourage you, go on YouTube, Facebook, website, and get that message. It's absolutely important that you become equipped and prepared for the journey ahead. And I want to ask you to continue to join us every subsequent Sunday until the series are completed. Amen? And so on Wednesday night, I'm teaching a second series of teaching separate from Sunday morning on the Christian's life and warfare using the book of Nehemiah. And tonight is the first installment from that teaching. And so now let's get into it. So a little background about the book of Nehemiah. Israel had been carried away into captivity to Babylon due to their disobedience as was prophesied by Jeremiah in chapter 25. Nehemiah is one of the restorative books that records for us what happened as God began to restore Israel back into its own land. Haggai also prophesied and talked about that. So did Ezra and Zechariah. Okay, so all those books to happen around the same. In fact, those guys, Haggai, uh, Ezra, Zechariah, and Nehemiah were contemporaries. Okay, and so what happened, what, what, what we see about the restoration of Israel were recorded by various of these authors to give us a full revelation of what actually took place. Zerubbabel led the first contingency from Babylon to Jerusalem. Accompanying him were two prophets named Haggai or Haggai and Zechariah, who spurred the people on, exhorting them to continue the process of rebuilding the temple. 57 years after that, a second group led by Ezra, who was a priest and a scribe, also began and actually, in fact, finished building of that temple that was began uh, by Zerubbabel and those that went with him. Okay, so Nehemiah became the third person who led a group to Israel to now begin to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. So Nehemiah's task was the rebuilding of the walls around the city so that the people can worship freely and without being attacked by the enemy. Now, this book of Nehemiah is a very important resource for many reasons. Number one, it's one of the best resources in the scriptures for teaching sound servant leadership. It's also an excellent book when it comes to the subject of revival. It's also a picture of the way the Holy Spirit rebuilds and restores the walls of the human personality. However, our study tonight and in subsequent weeks will reveal to us the basis of our work and warfare as Christians. We find in this book, and we're going to cover them, important steps that teaches us 
how to overcome three deadly enemies satan the world and our flesh three deadly enemies satan the world and our flesh okay so now let me just give some overview let me let me touch some important highlights in tonight's message there are certain types and key players in Nehemiah that I want to get out of the way before we dive into the real uh, uh, message. The first one is the wall. The wall surrounded Jerusalem with 10 gates built inside or within the walls. Okay? So the wall kept the wrong people out while the gates let or allowed the right people in. Okay? The walls were for protection and showed the separation between the people of God and his enemies. So the wall represents our salvation specifically from the power of sin. This is stated clearly in the scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 16, verse 18, it states that but you will call your walls salvation and your gates praise. Amen. You call your walls salvation and your wall and your and your gates praise. So throughout the Old Testament, the wall represented both the nation of Israel and the individuals as well. So you see the interchangeable uses of the word wall or walls representing Israel as a nation corporately and also individuals. We see this in the scriptures in Psalms 51 verse 18. David prayed, he said, by your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. King Solomon later on gave us uh, the uh, parallel uh, understanding of how walls also relate to individuals. He says in Proverbs 25, Verse 28, he said, like a city that is broken into and without walls, so is a man who has no control over his spirit. Therefore, the rebuilding of the walls can speak to us of our own individual lives or as God's people today, his body, the church. That's the wall. Now the gates. I told you that within the walls were built 10 gates. These gates represent the entrance into the Lord's presence and the experiences of the Lord that the righteous will enter into. And that's my prayer for you, that you, that, that God, that you will enter into the presence of God, into the fullness of what God has for you. Isaiah 26, in verses 1 and 2, says, He set walls for security. And now he goes on to say, Open the gates that the righteous may enter, the one that remains faithful. And then, of course, there's this very popular scripture, all of us perhaps know it, in Psalms 100, verse 4. He said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Amen? Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Okay? Jesus, we are told in the scriptures in John chapter 10, verse 7, he is the only way by which we can enter into the presence of God. So it's no surprise that Jesus said, truly I say to you, I'm the gate for the sheep. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and we go in and out and find a, a, a pasture. Amen. So we have the walls, we have the gates. Now, there are three, there are four key figures. Four key figures. The first one is Nehemiah, of course. Okay. And we're going to dive into that much later uh, when we read the scriptures concerning him. Uh, Nehemiah is a key figure, he's a leader. He was serving in Persia, and uh, he was the one who, uh, who became the catalyst to the rebuilding of these walls that we are talking about tonight. And you can see when we dive into his life that he is, he, 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 some part of his life shows an aspect of, of him being the type of Christ. We're going to get to that much later. So that's Nehemiah. Now let's talk about the three enemies. Remember the three enemies? Satan, the world. And our flesh, they're right here. Okay, the first one, Sambalat. They are all 
referenced in Nehemiah chapter 2 in verse 19. Sambalat is the first one. The name means hatred. Hatred, okay? So it's no secret who he is. Sambalat in these scriptures represents Satan himself who hates God and God's children. Secondly, we have Geshem. Geshem's name means uh, physical, tangible, material, and bodily. In short, what I say to us is Geshem represents the world, the world system, represents the world. That's another thing the believer has to contend with, with Satan who hates us and the world that do not understand us. Lastly, the third enemy is Tobiah. Tobiah, the name means Jehovah is good. Interestingly, Jehovah is good. That's what the name means. A strange name indeed for someone who so vigorously opposes Jehovah's chosen people. In all of his operations, Tobiah will clearly show himself to be our third enemy. Trust me, okay? He is represented as a type of old Adam, the flesh. Tobiah speaks of the sinful nature that not only does bad things, but has a tendency to also do good. That's why his name means Jehovah is good. Okay? So, we, 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 and, and, and I don't want you to be tricked by the name, by, by the meaning of the name when it says Jehovah is good. Okay? So, Sambala represents Satan. Geshem represents the world. And uh, Tobiah represents the flesh. So now let's just read, get into Nehemiah a little bit now. I've given you the overview, the background, the key players. You understand the context. Uh, you understand what's happened. So now let's read from Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. No, but I'm going to read from verses 1 to 3. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. You can just follow me uh, as I read. The words of Nehemiah, the son of of Akaleah. Now it happened in the month of Shivlev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So the book of Nehemiah begins with where every true salvation or revival has to start. With the realization of your spiritual condition. This is a new year. Uh, January the 11th, while this message is being uh, broadcast, many of us on New Year's Eve made New Year's res resolutions. But I wonder how many of us actually took stock and said, okay, God, 2022, these are my highs and these are my lows. And did a self-evaluation of how we have walked in the kingdom, how we have served God or how we have allowed God to live in and through us. Very rare do people sit down and just take stock of that. And the truth is, that's the beginning of any true spiritual revival. Me and you have to come to grip, to realize, to really acknowledge, God, I'm not all, I'm not living as best as I can. I'm not utilizing the gifts, the the talents, the resources you've given me to the full extent possible to advance the kingdom of God. We need to take stock. If, if I'm speaking to you tonight, perhaps you need to do that now. Take stock. Ask God, Holy Spirit, how well have I opened my heart to receive you, to allow you to be all that you want to be in my life? Which areas of my life is hindering your move in me? Now, there's a reason I'm telling you this. And we're going to get to that in a moment. So the beginning here, though, is Neymar. He reckoned with their condition. He was asking the Jews that came to see him. 
about the condition in Jerusalem. And they told him that the remnant that were left behind are in great distress and reproach. And that the walls of Jerusalem that should serve as a protection against the invasion of the enemy is broken down. And that the gates that allow the entrance into the presence of God is burned with fire. It doesn't get any, any worse than that. Now, let's pause for a moment <laughs> and, and, and carefully examine the picture we have here. Let's pause for a moment. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me bring something to your attention that you may not think about when you read these passages. Out of the whole world, God had but one chosen nation, Israel. This nation was chosen to be God's people to display the glory and the splendor of God and bring understanding of God and his loving kindness to other nations of the world. In other words, God was calling Israel out as a missionary nation that in and through Israel, the rest of the nations around her will see the goodness of God. I think Jesus said it best when he says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven. That's the purpose for which God chose Israel. The rest of the world around Israel was as is, as John tells us in 1 John 5, 19, the rest of the world around Israel was in the grip of the power of the evil one. Let me read two scriptures. That further helps to establish what um, uh, um, uh, uh, the point I'm trying to make. Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 5, in the contemporary English version, Ezekiel 5 5, in the contemporary English version, CEV, this is what it says I am the Lord God, and I've made Jerusalem the most important place. In the world and all the other nations admire it. What makes Jerusalem the most important place in the world? What makes it important? Is it because of the land? Is it because of the people? What, what makes it, according to this scripture, the most important place in the world? No doubt. What makes Jerusalem the most important place in the world at that time is the presence of God. They, the Israelites, were the custodians of the oracles of God. They were the ones that had the word of the Lord. They were the ones within which God dwelt. Remember the tabernacle, Exodus 25, verse 8? Let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, he says. So Israel was that nation that carried, glory to God, the presence of God. Mm. One more scripture. Then I'm going to lay it bare. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 in the NIV. It says, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Did you, did you hear that? Again, 
trying to help me and you understand why what Nehemiah was lamenting about was so was so was was was, was so critical. Why why it was such a a a a a a a a a a a a terrible thing that was happening that the walls were were torn down broken down and the gates were burned israel was the nation that god used as a barometer to creating and allowing all the other nations to exist in other words <laughs> god did not allow the population or the boundaries of all the other nations to exceed what Israel as a nation could handle. It would not let any nation, all the nations grow beyond Israel's ability to influence, to impact. Hallelujah. So Israel became the centerpiece of God's dealing with mankind in the Old Testament. Now, the only hope of these nations around Israel was in the form of this small nation called Israel. That was the only for that was the only hope for all the other nations. Okay, so now. If Israel was the only hope for all the other nations, the other nations cannot get God, they cannot see God, they cannot have access to God, uh, they can't see his glory, his power, none of that. Only Israel. Israel was the missionary nation to carry God to the rest of his nations. Now, if Israel was the only one that had this capacity, and we're now told that the nation was completely destroyed, the one who was to be God's only true witness, now completely destroyed, broken, and burnt to the ground. And there remain no walls of salvation, no gates to enter God's presence, and no visible sign of the living God on the earth. It was Satan's day as the entire world was in his control. Because the only nation that could stem the influence of Satan over the world was Israel, and now Israel was gone. Now, let's bring it home. This scenario speaks more than just Jerusalem 25 years ago. It speaks to us today of our own state. Man, I, I, you know, I did a teaching oh, maybe a couple of years ago now. And it's amazing to me to see how the church has been complicit in some of the terrible things that's happened in the history of our world. I won't go into all of that tonight, but let me just remind you of a few of them. Apartheid in Africa that held the black South Africans bondage for years, had a tacit approval of the church. The transatlantic slave trade <laughs> that took blacks out of Africa and planted them in Brazil, in the Caribbean, the England, and the United States had the approval of the church. Two world wars, Hitler had the tacit approval of the church. And now, even present day, today, now, as I speak, we saw the things that happened in the United States over the last couple of, or maybe this last year, or maybe two, maybe a couple of years now. Ditto. The church calls good evil and calls evil good for political reasons. And because of that, many young people are disenfranchised with the church. Because we've lost our saltiness 
and we've lost the integrity of standing upon the infallible, unadulterated word of the living God. Amen? So, what we are reading in Nehemiah is not just a story of, of 2,500 years ago. No, it's very relevant now. The church today is called as Israel was to be a missionary church. That's why I'm grateful for the church where I'm serving, a global artery church, <laughs> because we understand our responsibility to serve our world, both locally and abroad. But if the church is broken down, if our walls are broken and burned and our gates are destroyed, how can we effectively carry a message to the world? How? So yeah, like I said at the beginning, this message calls for soul searching. Because we're soul searching. Now, let me let me just add one little bit of information here, and I'm going to wrap this up in a minute. In Ezra chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Ezra chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. So the elders of the Jews built and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Edo. And they built and finished it according to the commandment of God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Verse 15, this is the point. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Eda, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. Okay, this is what I'm making. So before Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem to try to build the walls, the temple had been rebuilt previously through Ezra and his group. So this is the point. The temple is built, but the walls are not built. This, this is the relevant point to you and me today. The temple represents your spirit man. You are born again by the power of the spirit of living God. By grace, you've been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. Okay? It is not of works, but it's a gift of God. You are saved. So your spirit man is saved. The temple of God in you has been built. But this is a challenge. The walls which describes your soul because your spirit lives inside of you. Your emotion, your sentiment, your judgment, your will, all of that is broken down. That's what the walls represent. And that's the reason for which we are taking this study. And that's what the enemy, the three enemies, Satan, the world, and our flesh, that's, they want to use those three enemies to influence us in those areas that are still broken down. Amen? One scripture. One scripture in, uh, uh, in verse Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4. Nehemiah 1, 4. He said, Now it came to pass, about when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now, if, if one is not really very mindful, we'll miss something here notice Nehemiah's reference here i was fasting and praying before the god of heaven this is the picture of a man coming to god on god's terms in earlier times god had been called the god of heaven and the god of earth we see that reference in genesis chapter 24 in verse 3 let me just read it. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I'm living. So God has always been referred to as the God of heaven and, and the earth. Why is that? Why is that so important? It's important because we need to understand Jesus said, let that will be done in heaven as in the earth. So we see in that prayer, let that will be done in heaven as on the earth. The fact that God wants to not only be a God in heaven, but also wants his influence to span the earth. Amen. But what Nehemiah is saying when he said what he said in Nehemiah 1 4 is a recognition of the fact that, okay, God, 
I know you are in heaven. Nothing is touching your throne. But as far as the earth is concerned, sorry, no more witness. There's no witness of who God is because the Israelites are not only in bondage in Babylon, but the walls are broken down and the gates are in ruins. Amen. So Nehemiah was honest in saying that because of the state of his people, God no longer had a visible witness on the earth. So what's the solution to all of this? As I'm beginning to wrap up, and I want to encourage you, if you have any questions or comments, I want you to post them. I'm going to take the time uh, to address them uh, in the time that I have left. Uh, any questions or comments, if you just uh, share them with us, uh, we will we will go ahead and, and deal with that as we go on in this teaching. So in Nehemiah chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, I won't read all of it, but I want you to take the time to read it on your own. Uh, Nehemiah now began to pray the solution to what's happened to the walls of Jerusalem and to the gates. Look at the beginning of this prayer. Let me just read the beginning. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant, covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. So, how do we solve this problem of these broken walls, the walls that represents the nation and perhaps represents our human personality? Some of you are listening to me tonight and your walls are broken. You have issues with your soul. You have issues with your emotion. You have issues with your thinking. You are not, even though you've heard it over and over, you are not able to bring yourself to believe in God. You cannot trust people. You don't trust God. You are in fear, you are afraid, you are fretful, you are anxious. The list goes on and on and on and on. Perhaps you have financial need, perhaps you have a, a need for a healing in your body. So many things that's going on with all of us. The issue is, what's the solution? How do we get God involved in our solution? The answer is reminding God of his covenant promise to you reminding god of his covenant promise to you that's what nehemiah prayed he didn't pray out of oh oh god this no he prayed a prayer said god remember your covenant in other words remember your promises remember your word unto me upon which you've caused me to have hope in my time of affliction that's what the psalmist prayed and that's what we should be praying. Bring God's word back to his remembrance. Stand it upon the integrity of God's word. God, that cannot fail. The Bible says it's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. As it not said, it will not bring it to pass. And that no word spoken by God will not accomplish his purpose. He hastens to perform his word. Remind God of his word. Read God's word and let the, the, the power of his word saturate your mind. Amen? And in so doing, the Holy Spirit will begin to give you a direction on how to address whatever it is that's confronting you. Amen? And so I'm bringing this to a close now. I just want to pray for you. And Father God, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word this evening. I pray that Holy Spirit, you will water the seed of the word that I've brought to your people, that you cause them to uh, take hold in their hearts and you give them illumination. You open the eyes of their understanding and that you give them the encouragement to draw on you in whom is the hidden treasure of all spiritual knowledge and understanding. Thank you, Father God. We honor and we bless you. We praise your name, Lord God, that we receive strength to go the distance to the glory of your name. Thank you because you're a great God. Amen. And so, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And if you want to be a blessing to help us continue to serve the nations and serve our community, I want to encourage you, if you just can, the QR code on your screen, you've know, you, you, you'll you be instructed on how to give, how to uh, connect with us. If you have a prayer request, anything you want to say to us, we'll give you the room for the feedback. Okay? We love you. God bless you. And hope to see you 
on Sunday morning. And uh, well, I want to say a, a, a shout out to all of us that's uh, uh, logging on. Yeah, Mia Kande, it's good to see you. Fuala Shade Maps, it's good to uh, hear from you. Thank you for logging on and, and, and tuning in. And uh, listen, uh, Bright, thank you so much, uh, my, my friend, my friend. Thank you so much, Bright. It's good to, to see you on, online tonight. Ah, Sasha de Kenby, thank you. Thank you so much for all of you. Thank you. And Shana Kemala, oh, my wife. Okay, all right there. All right, wifey. It's good to see you too. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So really, I thank God for all of you. And uh, Sister Sumbo, Mona, yeah, all right there. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. It's good to see all of you. And I just want to encourage you. No person in Thailand. I give Thailand a shout out. Look at the map of the flag of Thailand behind me right there. So, you know, we, we think of the nations, okay? Amen. We love all of you guys. And uh, again, if you join us on Sunday morning. Uh, invite your friends. And just let's do let's build this community together and give God the glory and the honor. Love you guys. God bless you. See you next time. Peace and joy to you in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been watching the tuna. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this Bible study. And until next week, don't forget to check in and get your tuna.